everyone, my name is Sue Obedi and I am the director of Impact's Hollywood Bureau, where we work to change the narrative of Muslims in Hollywood so that audiences see Muslims as vital contributors to creating social and cultural change in America and around the world. Welcome to MPAC and Nickelodeon's table read of Netflix's original series, Glitch Text. Glitch Text has the privilege of being one of the most diverse series ever produced by Nickelodeon Animation. We are joined today by co-creators and executive producers, Eric Robles and Dan Milano. And we are so honored to also have most of the Glitch Text cast and one of its directors today because I really just want to dive in, I will let our illustrious moderator, TV critic for the Los Angeles Times, Lorraine Ali, introduce everyone and get the ball rolling. Lorraine, thank you for joining us today as our moderator, and it's all yours. Thank you, Sue. Um, I love how you pronounce my last name better than I do, so thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I am super honored, and this is going to be really fun to be part of this uh, Glitch Text webinar. Um, I wanted to just like quickly do a disclaimer or uh, whatever I want to say here. There's some glitches in my world here. There's construction outside, so if you hear something, I'm sorry ahead of time. <laughs> All right, so I know you have many fans that are watching this, but I kind of wanted to just give a quick background of the show, and then I want to introduce who's on our panel. Um, so if I get anything wrong here, you guys totally correct me. Okay, so Glitch Text. In the world of Glitch Text, Hanobi is a huge gaming and tech company that makes popular video game consoles. What Hanobi customers do not know is that their games sometimes glitch and release dangerous video game creatures into the real world. That's when the company sends the Glitch Text, these folks, um, out into the world to, uh, to, to grab these um, creatures back. Okay, so um, once the glitch is returned, the text must remove any evidence that was there, including any memories of the witnesses. Um, glitch text is a Nickelodeon production, but it's also Netflix, which is a little confusing. So you guys can explain that as we move yeah. forward. Second season dropped this month. Um, and we will talk about potentially a third season, which is exciting. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, but I would like to just jump in and um, introduce the rest of our panelists. Uh, we have Phil Alora, and I hope I'm saying that right. Um, That's correct. Okay. Um, story artist, animation director, directed an episode. Um, we Thank have you. Monica Ray, <laughs> who is Miko, voice of Miko, Miko. Uh, Richard Hurtado, am I saying that right, Richard? Ricardo. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, who's high five? <laughs> um, Luke Youngblood, who's Mitch Williams. Yeah. Um, Scott Kramer, who's Phil. Uh, Josh Sussman, who's Bergie. And Zara Fazel, who's sorry, I'm gonna get your name. See, your name is too close to your character. That's okay. I know it's confusing. Zara. You say it. You say it. Zara Fazel. Thank you. All right. So I just want to go to each of you that I just introduced and can you just really quickly, and I'll start back with Phil. Yeah. Like uh, just a sentence or two on, on what you do um, uh, on the show. Do you mean the real Phil or, or the other Phil on the show? <laughs> director Phil. Oh, uh, director Phil. <laughs> you have many roles. Okay, right, director right. Phil. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So I, I joined the show uh, back in 2017 to direct many episodes on first season as well as second season. And uh, it was a great opportunity. I want to say thank you so much for to Dan and Eric for inviting me to be part of the show, which was completely amazing and the amazing talented cr uh, crew that pulled together to make this show. What, um, what we did was basically we were, uh, or what I was doing was guiding our storyboard artists and our, our, you know, working with our art directors and our color stylists and the character designers all to make these shows come to life and deliver on all levels from comedy, action, adventure, excitement, and make sure it all came together uh, in the final product so that we went from script all the way through storyboard through uh animatic and then to a final delivery so it was it was a great opportunity and then um 
Eric and Dan, you are co-creators here. Can you just give us, I know this is so easy to do in a really brief little thing. Um, it's such a sort of creative premise for the show. Can you just give us some background on how you, how this happened? Yeah, how the heck did you know, this happen? You know, I, I, I was a big fan of like the original Ghostbusters series. And, I, you know, I, I just grew up in, you know, watching Saturday morning cartoons. And, you know, after finishing my last show, uh, Fanboy and Chum Chum, I was like, what do I want to do next? I wanted to do something that was completely different from that and dive into action adventure and still keep the comedy that I love. And, uh, you know, one day I was watching some Ghostbusters and I was like, man, they're not making any of those Ghostbusters anymore, right? Hmm, maybe somebody should come up with a new version of that thing, huh? And <laughs> from there, you know, popped up the idea. I was like, what if you take video games? What if you have like these geek squads and they come together and figure out how to take care of these uh, glitches that come out of your video game? And sure enough, I started sketching, coming up with ideas and I boarded uh, a whole sequence out. Um, and luckily, uh, Russell Hicks used to be the president of Nickelodeon. He found it in my box of ideas, took it out of there and said, hey, let's develop something with this. And, uh, you know, uh, luckily, I had worked with Dan before on a previous project. And I, you know, I knew he was a big Ghostbusters fan. So I was like, Dan, I got this idea. Um, you know, they're giving me the thumbs up to further develop this thing. Check it out. And sure enough, I send it to Dan. And typical Dan fashion, he came back with like 25 pages worth of like ideas. Of, <laughs> the franchise, all, all these ideas came out. And I was like, dude, we got to be partners again. Get over here and let's just keep working on this thing. And, and Dan, we developed when, it. Can I just ask you, Dan, when someone asks you, when you say, yes, I do this show, Glitch Text, and you explain it, they ask you, what is it about? And you explain it, like, what do you say? It is, it is difficult. It's, it's something that doesn't have a simple log line um, because it requires the, the understanding of the, the, the whole video game concept. But I just try to say, um, these are kids who work, um, you know, their, their first after school job basically um, for a tech company that, um, that seeks to do tech support for the video game glitches that escape you know, from the company's uh, video game machines. Um, and, that, and I also just encapsulate it less about premise and I more say this, you know, the show is a sci-fi comedy adventure series that's a love letter to gaming uh, and pop culture because that, that is really, I think, the, the core of it. You know, that's where everything connects to. Yeah, and that's what's so wonderful about the show is that it brings so many different cultures together, subcultures, um, niche things, uh, races, creeds, everything. So it's really nice that in a time when a lot of things are super divided, the show is not. Um, I want to get to the cast just to quickly talk about your characters and then we'll jump in to do the table read. Um, okay, so Ricardo, for High Five, how would you describe High Five or how do you, you give me your impressions of High Five. All right, uh, High Five is a very good-hearted, uh, nerdy gamer kid, and um, he, you know, comes from a low-income family, and uh, he's Hispanic, and I, I really love that about him because I'm also Hispanic, so I, I uh, um, you know, we both are Hispanic, and I love that. I get to speak Spanish on the show. That's one of my favorite things, and um, uh, in the show, you just see High Five, you know, just nerd out about all the, about all the games and everything, and it's, you know, he's also bad a when it comes to um you know handling all the glitches on the glitch text team so that's basically a little bit of high five <laughs> <laughs> okay um and monica how would you describe miko oh man uh miko is so many things <laughs> miko is excitable and she's like competitive but not to the point where it's like abrasive i feel like she's just um, I feel like she's a really modern voice of people who like video games today that maybe, you know, is like a refreshing take on just like an average teen who like happens to love video games and, you know, just work really hard at it and also reap the benefits of having a lot of friends in it and just having a lot of fun all the time. So she's a ray of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and Luke, um, Mitch, Mitch is an interesting guy. <laughs> Yeah, he is an interesting guy. Um, the way that I would describe him without being biased, um, he he's pretty much the best tech there is. I mean, <laughs> zero question when it comes down to 
who's gonna get the most XP. And um, I think just cause his eye is on the prize all the time, that can kind of come in the way of him being a nice person, which I do believe he is at the core. Um, there is a <laughs> certain softness underneath all of that, but he really, I think balances out the group, the cast, but at the same time is very serious about what they're, what they're doing. This is, this is real life and it's a life or death situation most of the time and Mitch, Mitch makes sure that things are, um, yeah, they're moving in the right direction. He's the best. All right. He's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's proven. <laughs> um, and um, Zara, how would you describe Zara? I'm gonna totally screw both your names up throughout no this. No worries, you can tell me either one. That's totally okay. fine. Um, Zara is, uh, I see her as sort of like the bigger sister in the group. She's cool. She's sarcastic. She's like calm and collected. She's got things under control, but deep down, she's still a teenage girl and she has a lot of dorky feelings and emotions that are, that she keeps underneath this cool, calm, collected surface. I just think she's so, uh, as Ricardo said, bad A as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, and Josh for Bergie? Uh, Bergie, he's a good friend. He's dependable and surprisingly a very good dancer too, um, <laughs> which we just learned. And yeah, he, he's good at his job. And yeah, he's just, he's, he's good at his job. You could always count on Bergie if yeah. there's some trouble. It might be a little literal, but yeah. what a nice guy. <laughs> uh, and then- um, The hard Bergie. I'll tell you that. <laughs> He's a huggable guy. Yeah, but right now with social distancing, I don't think anyone can hug Bergie. <laughs> no. <laughs> put a, it's all put a tech, virtual. A tech shield around each other. Yeah. And then uh, Scott for Phil. Yeah, Phil's pretty much the heartthrob. Uh, <laughs> uh, Phil is, the, he's basically the dad, you know, he runs the, the Bailey uh, glitch techs, uh, he's uh, cranky and put upon and wants to be left alone, but at the end of the day, he loves, he loves all the glitch techs, he loves his uh, little buddy bit, uh, he just, uh, you know, just wants to s sit in a quiet room and eat donuts, but uh, he loves, he loves his kids. So essentially, he's kind of like the Brad Pitt character is what you're saying. That's what I'm basically, right. that's what I'll, I would say that, but I would agree with you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the reasons, and I, I may have this wrong, but um, Dan and Eric, you could just speak quickly to this. One of the reasons that this is coming to you through MPAC right now for the viewers, and you have, I, I have to say, I was not super familiar with the show before doing this, and then it went MPAC contacted me and I started looking at your fan base. I was like, wow, you have some really, really loyal fans. Um, is that the diversity in the show is so wonderful and you had actually um, consulted maybe with MPAC um, for the Muslim character. I, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I just want to explain to viewers why this is part of what, what the connection with MPAC is. That is correct. We. Um... We were uh, just beginning our first season. I think we were writing our s second episode and one of our writers, um, David Anaxagoras, who had created a show on Amazon called um, Gordimer Gibbons, Life on Normal Street. He was just talking about how he had wanted to create a character for that show. Um, he's like, I really wanted to create a, a female Muslim character. It was very important to me to 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 see this kind of character and and, and you know, halfway through the conversation, you know, we realized, you know, because we were both white middle-aged men and we realized it was our privilege to sort of look at that as a, um, a, a lost opportunity. And it took a few minutes um, before we went, oh, well, wait, well, we're, we're doing a show right now. Like we're just, we're creating a show. <laughs> Let's just, we should have that character in the show just like anybody else. I mean, characters were just coming up organically through the process. And although that was more an intent, um, it started us off on an amazing path because it was that simple. We went to the design team and said, hey, this is what we'd like to do. And, you know, Eric was immediately on board. Uh, everyone we spoke to was on board, the network. And all the network said was, um, well, you know, you want to make sure that you, you know, since, since none of you are, um, you want to make sure that you just don't 
misrepresent in any way. So we should do a consultancy. Mm -hmm. And Megan Casey introduced us to Sue uh, and her team at the time who were just lovely. We just, I mean, you just want char char good characters are about details. And whatever your truth is as a person or your point of view in the world provides detail. Uh, they may not affect everything the character does because we are not our race and we are not one thing, but it certainly adds something to the mix. And, you know, we enjoyed it profusely and Impact was just so thoughtful in, you know, all their um, interactions with us. So that began a great relationship. Yeah, and, and right out right out the gate, we just uh, had a lot of diversity in the show. I mean, you know, having yeah. High Five, having Nico, I mean, you know, our two main characters were already diverse. And then just kind of the evolution of it all really came from them in a way because, you know, we didn't have a race or a color for uh, Mitch Williams when we were developing him. You know, he was just a character we wanted and we were still trying to figure him out. But then Luke came in, you know, for his audition and, you know, he read the role and he asked us, hey, do you want me to do this uh, with an American accent? And we're like, what? <laughs> you know, your, your, your voice is already awesome. Like, go in there and do it that way. And he did. And, you know, he was that character. Like, he was the character we were looking for. So we, we developed the character, designed the character based off of, like, who Luke was because he just brought so yeah. much to, to that role. They began as archetypes, really, you know, in trying, because we began with premise first, too. It was a concept. And as we populated the world, we had more archetypal relationships. But as with every audition, the actors came in and completely redefined it and affected the writing, design, everything. Um, Scott and Monica had the benefit of being involved a little earlier in the production because we knew them through Nickelodeon. But even their characters grew exponentially once, you know, they were behind the mic regularly. Um, so everyone sort of affected their characters. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at our whole team, uh, you know, w whether it's the crew or the cast, it's a big diverse uh, team, you know. So, uh, again, I, just myself growing up, born and raised out here in Los Angeles, that's all I've, I've known is diversity. So why not have it in the show? Right, right. And it, um, it definitely, I would say, it's great to not only, you know, show the connection between all the characters but show their differences and then show how all together those are strengths you know as as one unit yeah, okay absolutely. so let's move into the table read yeah. is that am i okay are we okay to do that yeah, do you guys want to set it up <laughs> this uh first episode um this is a, a series called buds this was originally episode 10 in our production order it appears a little later in our netflix order where we get to know the character of Mitch Williams a little bit. And um, when Mitch is introduced in the series, he's very much an adversary to Five and Nico, uh, simply because Mitch, he is the best tech. He's somebody who takes it very seriously. And the best way to put it, I think, is that he identifies as a gamer and a tech and not much else. There's not a lot of room. So he is incredible because it's all he does and he's passionate about it and he has respect for it and he has respect for others who respect it. But it's since it's all he has, it's a lot to protect. Yeah. So it also when he, isolates him, which was part of the problem in this episode. It, it definitely isolates him. So yes. So um, the techs show up for jobs um, when they get a call that there's some tech that's on the fritz and they show up as a team. And this is a case where Mitch Williams has decided he's going to go ahead in and he is going to check things out. And then he's going to give the all clear. When he gives the all clear, everybody else can come and move in. So we get a sense of what kind of leader he is. So when our scene begins, we are exterior a house. And the text turned to see the house go from full of glitchy energy to being normalized, after which Mitch exits the place, dusting off his hands from a job well done. All clear. Great, so what do you need the rest of us to do? Nothing. Anymore. Mitch chuckles, starts heading for his van, and Five's jaw drops. You said you were gonna teach us a lesson. And that it'd be one you'd never forget. And you won't. Will you? Five cuts Mitch off before he can leave. No. All right, you don't get to say something and just walk away this time. You walk around like you're a heavy. 
but really you're just a selfish punk who's just too afraid to work with us instead of instead of against us. Zara and Miko both react as Zara records this with her phone. Dang. <laughs> but Mitch just tries to wave it off. Please. This is glitch text, not Mitch text. We're a team, so if you're not willing to be a team player, then we're better off without you. Mitch catches Miko and Zara listening and is too flustered to retort. He climbs in his van and drives off, leaving, leaving the others to rally behind five. Whoa! You really told him off, partner! Yeah, I guess I did. Zara puts a hand on Five's shoulder, then realizes it and takes it away suddenly. He didn't even have a comeback. I mean, Mitch always has a comeback. I, I gotta go post this to every tech I know. And as she crosses off, Miko offers Five a fist bump. Well, after all that drama, I think you've earned yourself a little game time. Let's co-op till we drop. And as the vans <laughs> drive off... <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, and they leave Bergie still standing on the front lawn of the house. Wait, so wait, wait. But before he left, did Mitch happen to say if we could move or talk now? <laughs> and that's the end of that scene. So that was a big deal that uh, Mitch was confronted for the first time. He's not used to that. Yeah, I definitely remember having a big conversation about that scene. So what a great scene. That was, that sure. was excellent. Is that, it's so natural when you guys are going back and forth. Um, does it feel that way when you're doing that? I mean, it sounds like you've been apart for a little while. So does it, like, Ricardo, when you're doing this, does it feel like, oh, this is natural. I'm falling right back into it? Yeah, it totally feels natural. I mean, we've been working on this for a long time. And it really is just, it's so nice to, you know, have this and just get to do the scenes with each other right now. It's like such, it feels so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing we wanted to add to that as well is that that's probably one of the first times that we've actually been able to read it as an entire cast because a lot of our recording sessions are separate due to like scheduling or um, different things that we need to get that day and so it's cool for everyone to be here together and hats off to Dan and Eric who are able to hear the entire scene in their heads and know that we're all playing it um, correctly for it to just be so cohesive. It just <laughs> blows my mind. So yeah, you guys are geniuses. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll, t I'll say it again, just that, that scene in particular, I just remember it uh, being so important because I wanted to make sure that, you know, it's the first time Five's really gonna confront Mitch in a situation like that. And that's a big deal because Mitch is all, he is the heavy, right? Like he has been the heavy and he basically controls his environment. And it was the first time where Five was really going to, like, get in his face about it. And, you know, again, I've been in situations like that as a kid. And when you confront somebody like that, you better be ready to confront somebody. So, you know, I know we talked about that in the room, making sure that it felt, it felt like somebody really confronting him, saying, like, I had enough. And mm -hmm. you, you know, you being the bully, like, you're not going to do this to us anymore, right? And so I just love that these guys really brought it and they brought it to the screen and Phil was able to get, you know, his board artist to really kind of make sure that it felt really strong. And it was just such a great scene and having, you know, uh, Monica and Zara there, you know, also, it, you know, as their characters really just kind of going like, Oh man, that's a big deal. Right. Yes. Like, yeah. They give it import their, their reaction and Mitch's, uh, you know, um, being a bit flustered because he knows they're watching as opposed to him and Five having maybe been alone together where there are no witnesses to this happening. Those kind of subtleties are tricky to pull off and it's where the direction and the, and the, and, and the board artists really, really come through. Mm -hmm. So it's not just big action series. There's like subtle nonverbal acting going on and the acting that is there is also just you know, these snapshots of a moment, even just Five and, and Amiko and Zara, I mean, saying, dang, like, that's a feeling. We've all been in that situation, had that feeling. So you hopefully get that right. So you can feel what they're feeling and laugh, but you can feel what Mitch is feeling and cringe off, you know, one word, but it's important. So um, we're, we're, we're so proud of that. And this team is just so, so incredibly thoughtful. And the benefit of animation is that we do have a few passes to, to revise these things when we need to, to create cohesion in the performance. Um, 
but it's it, it's usually just a matter of rhythm. It's never that that performances need to be redone. It's just that you want everyone in the same syncopation, you know, same energy. Right. That's definitely uh, something that we really try. Like I really try to work with board artists closely and talk about subtext, what the characters are feeling in every scene, so that we understand their motivation. So it's just like coaching actors. You know, it's like what are they feeling? How are they feeling about each other at these moments? And like, how can we really bring that out in our drawings so that when it goes into animation, not only uh, do we see it on screen, but we, as Dan was saying, we feel it come through the characters and they really come alive for the story. And that really makes the story very, very rich. Uh, last I'll comment too, but for those listening who may be interested or be in a position to do this themselves, what really helped is to make sure that um, the actors all saw the, the boards at whatever stage they were in, whenever possible, and that the uh, board artists would come and visit records, or they would hang out together in the production office if they had a little time, because it really did become a tandem performance of, you know, body and voice and mind. And you know, the more you could get them to know each other and share a brain, that became very important too, it, especially in the later episodes when everyone was kind of growing together. And I want to say that that's unique to other animated shows where on other shows, sometimes you would just go in and record and the actors never meet the animators or meet the crew. And that's what I think is so special and unique that we all, we would get to spend time together. And I think it really just, it comes through in the episodes. That's that switch text part uh, for production standpoint. Like most shows, that, that never happens. But on this show, it was really unique where we all got to spend time together, share ideas together and collaborate to make something that truly stands out. And it's, it's interesting because you guys, it just all of you here on the panel, you're from different backgrounds, just in terms of some of you have done you know, what is it, live action, I'm probably saying this one, but you know, you, you, you're not, you didn't, weren't just doing voiceover stuff or you didn't just come from the animation world. So when, I'm, I'm gonna pose some um, questions to you from people that are watching, but feel free to like jump in with some of your background and how it's informed, you know, what you're doing on the show now. Um, one of the questions from uh, somebody watching us right now that sounds so creepy. Someone's watching. Right <laughs> um, We're all watching each other. Okay. <laughs> and I'll throw this um, to you guys. Um, what has been your favorite episode so far? So I'm going to throw this to Monica. <laughs> or Monica, throw it to somebody else if you need a minute. Uh, oh, we can we can jump in. I mean, I think I think my favorite episode early on was probably Castlestein, just because it it really covered this whole gambit of like what it's like to play a video game that drives you insane and how it drives all the characters insane. <laughs> like we got to see five kind of at his wits end with it. And then we inevitably got to see Miko who started off in the episode so confident and so like in the sort of position of like, I'll take you through this, no problem. And then the whole thing just gets flipped and she's just like completely like floored by it. And it's, it's so much fun to see that range of her just go from like, don't worry about a kid, I'll get you through this, to like, we're all gonna die. <laughs> so that was a really fun, that was a really fun episode for me to record. Um, and Scott, how about you? Well, uh, you know, um, as, as uh, they were saying, we didn't, as Luke was saying, we don't normally get to record together. Um, uh, in the real glitch text, uh, I did actually get to record for an hour with Jane Lynch uh, yeah. in the booth, just sort of insulting each other uh, for an hour, <laughs> and it was really fun. Uh, <laughs> it was just a really kind of a bucket list kind of thing. So, uh, also, I loved, I loved the whole, I loved the episode as well, but as, as for my part, uh, yeah, that, that'll uh, be something I won't ever forget. <laughs> um, and then, um, do you, I'm sorry I have to keep calling on you like we're in school. It's so hard with Zoom to, you know, have a, everybody jump in. But, um, uh, I don't know, Zara, what, what was your favorite one? Oh, gosh. I mean, I really love the episode we're reading today right now, but because I think it's the first time you get a glimpse into what's going on underneath Zara's surface. Yeah. Um, and 
interestingly, in the audition sides for Zara, when I first read it, there were several lines from this episode in those sides. So it was so helpful for me to know what was going on with her um, when I auditioned for the role, um, because you don't see that in her first appearance necessarily. So I really love this episode. I also really love an episode that is yet unproduced, um, but I won't say anything more about that in the hopes that one day we will be able to produce it. (laughs) <laughs> with the ensemble really did start to take over more than we even thought we tried to make sure that even if a character had one or two lines we we tried to write for them as if they were the mains or it's almost even more important if you've only got a couple lines make them count it can't just be like me too guys it's got to be something that tells you who they are or something about their point of view um which lets us develop them in some way and not only did everyone get time to shine, but in in the unproduced episodes, there's a lot more of everyone um, because they're so strong. They started to take more, you know, everyone takes some central screen time uh, or shares it evenly with Five and Miko, who are the, the core of, you know, the initial story. We meet them, the world through their eyes, and that remains consistent to some degree, but they fully share episodes with characters like, you know, Bergi and Zara and, um, and uh, Hanish, played by Sandeep Parikh, who's not here with us today, who's also an amazing character on the show. And, you know, because we started really exploring the characters later on, like, when we did, um, when we uh, put, uh, it was Bergy and Five together in Collection Quest, Oh yeah! Oh my gosh! That was my favorite magic. episode. That, that episode was magic. You know, I just love when two goofballs get together and have fun. And these guys <laughs> were just having a blast in that episode. And I just yeah. remember, like, wow, the possibilities of just seeing the the mix mash of relationships, right? Because we're always used to Five and Nico, and we got to know them so well. And then we started discovering all the other texts. And then, you know, in future episodes, that's what we were thinking. We we're like, oh my gosh. It'd be great to see, uh, you know, Miko and Mitch just hang out for a day and see w- what kind of crazy uh, hijinks they would get into. Yeah. And imagine them because we got to know the character so well. And, and you know, again, w- what a, you know, strange first state it might have been for uh, uh, Zara and Five to hang out on a mission for the first time. Like things like this that were just kind of like, wow, you, we could see the potential after seeing the characters grow. Right. And we, um, we have another question, and you guys feel free, again, like when we're talking about other things, if you want to come back to something, it's fine, but um, this is specifically for Luke. What mm-hmm. kind of personal attributes of yours do you put into Mitch, and what's your favorite thing about his character? You kind of answered a little bit of this, but not the personal attribute part. Yeah, um, I mean, finding, because I'm such a nice person in real life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's so hard to sometimes get into a character. No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> it's so nice. It's so true, nice. though. It's true. Yes. It's true. Thanks, Sarah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pay you later. Um, but no, I think Dan, one thing that I will say about working with Dan and Eric on this, they, they really want us to bring ourselves to it. And especially me being like from the UK and stuff, there'll be like certain words that I would just put in and like, oh, like if whatever you've got and whatever you're feeling naturally, go with it. And so it definitely is like in the way that I speak, the cadence and um, I think just also being so determined to do such a good job all the time when it's something that I enjoy so much. And all of us, I've I've cast and crew, this has been such a dream job to be a part of and have the opportunity to um, to come to work every day and just have so much fun with it that you want to be in there creating the best version of, of what you can do. And I think Mitch is very similar in that sense, albeit um, he's just not as friendly or nice as um, I try to be in my everyday life. <laughs> But um, yeah, definitely a lot of like little words and things here and there. And as I watch some of the episodes, it kind of catches me off guard because a lot of the time, like now that I live in America, um, English isms will stand out to me. So as I'm watching Mitch um, saying like bog off and things like that, it like, it 
it really stands out to me because it's just so British. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. It's so cool. Well, um, Ricardo, you were saying this earlier that like with High Five, you can go between Spanish and English and you can sort of infuse like how much of your own personality or your own background do you feel like is infused in High Five or if you can speak to that? Yeah, you know, High Five is just seriously one of, one of the most incredible roles I've ever done. Um, I was actually, this, Glitchix was my first ever animation audition and I'm just so thankful to God that he allowed me to be part of such an amazing project. High Five, the thing I love about High Five and um, just about Glitchix is that, you know, to see a Hispanic um, you know, being a lead role in a show, I think is just so cool. Um, I love seeing that. And uh, like I said before, I come from a Hispanic background. Both of my parents are from Nicaragua and I speak fluent Spanish. So um, I just love that I could go to work and I could, you know, a lot of the time when we were filming or when we were recording in the booth, um, Dan and Eric would love for us to improv and just throw stuff in there. So anytime I could, I could try to think of anything in, in Spanish to throw in there. Uh, I would try to do so, and, and they would always do their best to implement that, and I just really appreciated that. I thought that was so cool. And then, um, Dan, I just, Eric, do you want to do another table read, or what, what, do you want to do that n now? Or you? Yeah, we could jump into the next progression of the scene. Uh, Phil, since you have an animatic, um, maybe if you could skim ahead and just sh show people what happens to Mitch. A after High Five confronts Mitch, um, Mitch has accidentally, because he handled it himself and didn't include everyone else, he didn't clean up the glitch as well as he thought, and he brings a little bit of glitch contamination back with him to headquarters, and this copycat glitch um, manages to get the drop on him and replace Mitch with a digital clone of himself that pulls um, some personality traits from his programmed personality. So, uh, on page nine, we start scene two with um, uh, Five and Miko playing video games, and they're playing that game Pixel Panic they were talking about earlier, and suddenly, Clone Mitch enters the room uh, to take a seat between them. Uh, he looks exactly like Mitch, except for a baseball cap with the letters BUDS printed on the front. <laughs> hey, 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 ooh, is that the original Pixel Panic? Oh, I love this game. May I hop on? You want to co-op with us? Wearing a hat? <laughs> oh, um, uh, yeah, well, the truth is, I thought about the things that you said to me today, Five, and, and look, man, you were right. I was? He was? At this point, we see the others have taken notice, and Five and Miko bump fists. Mitch takes the hit with a smile. I can be selfish mean and as phony as my hair extensions. I guess when Glitch Text turned my life into a video game, I kind of became, you know, some obnoxious video game character. Does that make sense? Everyone looks at each other, does it? I, I guess games do allow us all to become our alternate selves. Yeah, mine is a wood elf herbologist named Dark Krista. For you, Bergy. Whatever the case, I'd like to make up for it. I'd like to make up for having been so selfish by throwing you all a party! What? what? A party? How does that make up for anything? Okay, okay. So, as an act of good faith, I'm transferring my XP points back to you guys. Not just for today, though, but for the week. Clone Mitch presses a button on his gauntlet, and we see his XP go down, and the other text gauntlets ding with an XP gain. Whoa! Whoa. You're really not bluffing this time. I'm done being afraid. If you let me, I want to be part of the team. What do you say? Buds? Five checks with the others, and then goes to accept. Buds. When suddenly, Phil sticks a plunger in Mitch's hand. Hey, Mitch, bathroom door is stuck again. You know the rules. You stick it, you fix it. So... Phil, bud, I was just in there and the place is clean as a whistle. Whistles are filthy. Clone Mitch puts a chummy arm around Phil, who stiffens. Oh, 
Phil. You've put up with my bad attitude for years. He pats Phil's tummy. All react with disbelief. What? What is happening? <laughs> but I can make that up to you, bud. With a party here tonight that will bring us all together. No. But Phil, this could really bolster team morale. Mitch purposefully starts to te steer Phil towards the door where hidden tentacles await to greet them. No. They exit, leaving the text alone. Okay, that was creepy and weird. Wow, he really listened to me. Look, you guys all know Phil. There is no way he's going to let Mitch throw a party here tonight. Clone Phil walks in with a Bud's hat, just like Mitch. Mitch is throwing a party here tonight. No! Yes. <laughs> Do we get to bring a plus five? I, I mean a plus one. Plus one. I said plus one. Dark Krista of the Bloodbriar clan accepts your invitation. Is this like a role play party? Ooh, I call wizard. And then Bit enters with a sudden alert. Alert! My auto detection system detects a sudden peak in glitch. But Clone Phil slaps his hand over Bit's face. Tech enthusiasm? <laughs> well detected, my friend. Come along with me. I'll update you on the situation. Clone ca Phil carries a mumbling bit out of the room. Miko turns back to five and her pixel panic game. Uh, so a battered game night. You want to bail on pixel panic for Mitch's weird party thing. <laughs> Sorry, I laughed. Five <laughs> answers with a hopeful grin. Uh, uh, fine. But there's something I'm not buying about this whole Mitch becoming a nice guy act. What? Whoever wants to make friendship bracelets, raise your hands! Everything. <laughs> End scene. <laughs> Good job. Oh, Dan, I've missed your bit voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's part of the cast, the whole, the whole bit thing. Based on a toy robot I had as a child. <laughs> I was laughing, too, because this, of course, is, is Five's face when he wants to uh, go to the party instead of playing games with Miko. <laughs> it's just one of those great little off-model off poses. How can you that say was, no? That was, yes. That was something that the uh, board artist, uh, very talented, uh, Sheldon, had put into our board, and it was just the right look, the right gag at the right time, and it just, like, it sent everyone on the floor laughing, which was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the freedom, you know, again, that I wanted to bring to the show is, like, this this mix, right? Like, I, I wanted to do an action show, but I love the fact that we can do comedy and the visuals of the comedy and intersect them and just have fun with it, and I just love the success it had, you know? It was an experiment, but it really worked out for us. We had, um, a question kind of from someone watching, um, and it kind of gets to that, but um, they wanted to know how you guys developed the art style and decided on the bright color scheme for the TV show. And there's other questions in here too from people who are interested in getting into animation, like, you know, how, what, what tips would you give them? So if you three can kind of answer that. Uh, that's a good one, that's a good one. Uh, well, I think Dan, Dan and Eric could speak to the developing the look of the show, but I do agree with Eric. Like we definitely uh, were encouraged to participate as much as possible in the storytelling process, uh, eliciting every um, nuance of influence that our board artists and directors and art directors and uh, color designers and everyone could contribute, which was a fantastic opportunity that Dan and Eric really embraced and encouraged actively, which is quite rare in most animated shows, uh, just for those who are out there. Um, so when you have an opportunity like that, it's a very unique, special thing to really appreciate. And, and I think everybody also has, as the voice cast has shared, like they were also bringing their special uh, takes on things to the production, which was really helpful to boost the overall show uh, aesthetic. So. Um, but perhaps Dan and, Dan and Eric, like you want to take it on to how the show look was developed. Yeah. Uh, 
Eric, I want you to answer that, but I am also posting in our uh, chat um, for that we can pass on to everyone else a link to a Google Drive where we have kind of a, a Q and A with not only Phil um, and Eric, but our our uh, lead designer and some of our board artists. Specifically, there are a lot of questions there that they answered themselves about developing your portfolio, about the look of the show, about their approach personally. So um, you can look that up as a second source. Yeah, I mean, as far as uh, the look of the show, you know, uh, doing a 2D show can be tricky sometimes because ultimately it, it really relies on the, the animation studio who's gonna animate your show. Um, you know, you can do the most amazing pre-production you know, you can with your team, it could look amazing, but if it goes to the wrong studio overseas, you just never know what you're gonna get. Um, so back in like 2006 or so, I discovered a French anime called Wakfu. And I just love the style of that show because they, it was a, a flash and traditional animation show. And I love how they were able to utilize um, flash in the sense of you using a lot of the talking head scenes that we call them when characters are just kind of standing there talking. Um, and utilizing the flash for that because the characters wouldn't go off model. And a lot of times when you go the traditional animation route, you just never know who's going to be adding, animating your scenes. So, you know, sometimes your characters can look a little wonky, a little off, but, you know, in flash or harmony, the characters stay very much on model. And so I figured the best way to utilize, uh, you know, this technique was to go into harmony. And this is a, a, a program where the characters were basically what they, they can stay on model and then really uh, utilize your animation with traditional animation. So that's how we kind of like use the formula of doing uh, harmony and traditional animation for this series. So when you look at our show, we have these really dynamic action poses and scenes. And then for our talking heads, the characters always look perfectly on model. So it was just a great kind of collaboration that we did with the show. We, we um, were able, when I say we, it was uh, Ian Graham, our supervising producer and myself, we went out there and hunted a lot of these French animators um, because we were just fans of their work. And a lot of them had worked on the series Wakfu that I was a fan of. So we got a studio together out in Paris, France and brought this amazing team of animators together to, to really kind of help us uh, with the amazing animation that you see in the show. And then with the help of another studio uh, called Top Draw in the Philippines, they were able to do a lot of the cleanup uh, work and a lot of those other talking head scenes as well. So it was just an, a great back and forth and collaboration. When it comes to the overall look of the show, I, I'm a big fan of bright colors. I always have been. Um, but, you know, I like using darks and brights. And Scott Kakuda, our art director, was the one who really opened my eyes to, uh, you know, bright and brighter <laughs> so daytime colors which you know was kind of uh, really awesome to see how he utilized bright colors and still were you were able to keep the characters very vibrant and um so he really kind of schooled me on that with with his art direction so together we just collaborated and kind of just came up with this look for the series but scott kakuto is an amazing uh, art director that came from video games and he brought a lot of his knowledge and his skills into the show. So he's one of those guys who's multi-talented and can do pretty much anything, right? So we just really dug in there and kind of started coming up with theories and ideas of how to best um, be smart about this production, but also just kind of the general style of the show. Okay, and I'm getting a lot of questions about merch. When... <laughs> Is there going to be merch? Will there be merch? Um, so far, I'm buying off Redbubble. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, if there is merch, um, I would like to, it'd be interesting for some of the casts, like, I don't know, what would, what would the Bergy merch be? What would, you yeah. know, High Five merch be? So can you guys kind of answer those questions? I know we have to, t if everyone tweets Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon, they're smart. They'll be like, whoa, there's money to be made. So yeah. everyone who wants it, <laughs> Nickelodeon. If, if, the, if the fans want merch, I mean, just ha hashtag and, you know, tweet to Nickelodeon. I mean, ultimately, they're the ones who make the big decisions. If it were up to us, we would already all be wearing our caps and our shirts and our figures. And everything Every toy 
game and and clothing web uh, company has a website and they have a section that says contact us and you just let them know what you want and then it's likely you can get it but i would love to know what everybody thinks their products uh would be with you I know yeah, like, that's that's yeah. like yeah what, what would uh what would bergy bergy what would you want i want the gauntlet um and and, and imagine if you had a gauntlet and there's a place where you could put your smartphone in it and it could actually work. I think by the time we get to iPhone 13, we could have combined <laughs> that with gauntlet technology. Um, <laughs> Google uh, glasses. Okay, writing this down. Hold on. Hey, yeah, merch, merch companies better hurry up because uh, fans are already on it. You can get the 3D printer files right, right off of Twitter at this point. So, you know, you hope these companies step up. Wait, Luke, what were you gonna, you were gonna say something? I want, I want the season two uniform upgrade. That's, yeah. that's what I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty Definitely. cool. Definitely. I was watching today, because I was, I was going back through a couple of the episodes, and I was just like, damn, we, we look good. I look good. They do. I want to see video games, like Castle Steam video games, and have video games mm. of the games we see in glitch text and where you could play as the text and go into the games that we went into in the show. I'll play yeah. that. That would be so cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, like some G.I. Joe action figure characters, yeah. like for High Five, Miko, like all the glitch text, that would be so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, figures, yeah. yeah. Figma figures, Figma, that would be a great line. Yeah. Uh, style figures, <laughs> the high-end figures that are fully articulated. Oh, yeah, that would be sick. amazing. What about an app like Pokemon Go, but for glitch text, so you can find glitches in real life and catch them? I think that would be a million dollar idea, idea. Nickelodeon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all kind of a no-brainer, shockingly, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> um, did you want to do a third table read, or should we continue? Uh, yeah. I, I put it. I put it to our cast. I think. If we did, we would maybe should just go to the very last scene so we can have the closure yeah, for the character. Um, and okay. I can ask a question for right now if you need to set that up. I can ask. Um, I think I'm ready. If you guys are, we can jump right in on page 22. Um, so uh, Mitch really charms everybody. Uh, and one by one, they all start getting turned into um, glitchy clone replacements of themselves, which was kind of like a a classic sci-fi um, trope we wanted to play with because it allows us to see other sides of our characters. Because I'm proud to say Zara is not defined by uh, a, a preoccupation with High Five, but after seeing her a couple episodes, it was a really refreshing thing to to know that she had another side to her and it was a particularly kind of nervous side. Um, and um, one by one, everybody starts to change and Miko is really, really, uh, seeing this happen in front of her eyes, but Five is a little distracted, feeling that he had such an, an effect on Mitch, and and he changed him with his with his confrontation. So Five finds out pretty soon that uh, that's not the case. Everyone is turned into clone tentacle people, including Miko, and now he is running for his life uh, down the hallway of HQ, uh, bracing a door behind him to catch his breath until his gauntlet picks up a signal. Glitch corruption source located. He steps forward and takes in the view. Oh, fun. And he sees he's in the glitch's lair, a massive version of the scene back in that suburban house where goo is covering the walls. The actual glitch techs are imprisoned here in pods stuck to the ceiling. And central to this is the sleeping queen glitch. Okay, take a scan and locate in glitch reference library. What game is this thing from anyway? Game located, Burrowing Underground Doppelganger Squad. Five starts to put that together and understand. B-U-D-S, buds. Okay, things are getting a little M for mature up in here right now. Then Clone Mitch appears, smiling. Relax, Five, it's me, Mitch Williams. Yeah, more like Glitch Williams. I can't believe I just said that right now. Mitch approaches five, arms open in friendship. Uh, Mitch Tex, glitch Tex. I am the Mitch you remember. Clones are just backups restored from memories of the original hosts. 
we bring out the best in everyone. So finally, we can all be buds. During this, we glimpse the real Mitch in one of the pods. Uh, you plug into people's brains? Not cool, bro. Really not cool. Admit it. You like this version better, don't you? This Mitch can be a teacher, a team player, a best bud. Five reaches out wearily, and he takes Clone Mitch's hand. Sorry, Glitch. Then he activates his gauntlet. I already have a best bud. Reveal the real Miko aiming her gauntlet from behind Mitch. Feelings mutual, Cap. Clone Mitch roars, revealing his tentacle form. He closes his tentacles around Five and Miko, but they blast free. The, the queen screeches as we enter a huge boss battle. Hey, Miko, I'm really sorry I didn't. Yup, all's forgiven. There's so many. We can't bring them all down with two gauntlets. Five looks at the trap text and has an idea. So let's get some more. They start shooting, releasing Hanish, Zara, Bergy, and Nyx from the tentacle pods. Phil and Bitter freed too, but get stuck. The techs all power up, ready to do battle. Let's party! <laughs> <laughs> and then zap, 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 zap. <laughs> <laughs> so they, and, uh, they, save, they save Mitch. They finally work together with Mitch to... to bring the, the, the creature down. Uh, but there aren't any large redemptions. Um, it's just that we've seen another side of Mitch through this encounter. Uh, at the end of the story, you know, things don't necessarily reset. As an episodic show, we do stories that are resolved in each episode, but we also do tent poles to a larger story and we try not to reset. So Mitch doesn't just go back to being a jerk we're left with the feeling that he knows and Five knows that Five really saw through to, to Mitch and Mitch's insecurity. And when you see them in relationships in subsequent episodes, the relationship dynamic is different. And we try to carry that, that forward throughout. I got a, I got a little treat. Um, while, while you ask questions or I'll go ahead and do a how to draw Miko and Five. How's that? Nice. Oh, yes. Awesome. Right. <laughs> so you set us up for some questions, I guess, and then I'll, I'll figure okay. out the screenshot. Well, we have um, a question for Monica. Um, and uh, how would you relate to Miko aside from gaming? And what games or consoles did you grow up with? Howie. Um, I mean, Miko and I go way back. It's, it's, I related to her, like, even during the development phase, like there, you know, there was something about her character that was just like so fun and energetic, but it like, it wasn't like grating. And it was just like, it really, <laughs> I really connected with her because I think sometimes I am that person. Like I am the, the loud one that runs forward. and doesn't have a plan. Um, but uh, that is something that I feel is like a, a really important part of her personality that is like, works really well with like the show and the setting and every, all the other characters around her. And it's just like, it's really nice to see um, kind of the, the brashness be embraced. <laughs> um, whereas sometimes <laughs> I feel like in my real life when I'm like brash and like outgoing, sometimes I feel like I'm being like, oh, I need to step back just a hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, consoles, games, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of at an advantage here because like I did play a lot of video games growing up, so I feel like I was a big Nintendo person. I don't know. It was like, the problem with games is that when you're growing up, your parents are the ones who are like, what? You want me to buy what? <laughs> and so you can only pick, like, one thing. So it, whatever you ended up kind of gravitating to as a kid is usually what whatever your parents were like, okay, we'll get you a Wii, or like, we'll get you a PS4, and it's just like, Making the making the argument for both a PS4 and an Xbox, it's not gonna fly. So, <laughs> um, so that was that was kind of me. I was just kind of all over Nintendo, all over whatever I could get. Um, yeah, and it, I I love watching you draw. That it's fantastic watching. Um, that's Eric in real time. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really <laughs> I'm so, 
Don't you? Uh, she would work at the Oh, you're not even breaking eye contact with us. That's no, incredible. I'm, I'm <laughs> so multi talented. Um, <laughs> like, I can do it with my eyes closed. <laughs> Is this in real time? <laughs> it's all <laughs> amazing. For other people in the cast, that's a, it's an interesting question. What games or consoles did you grow up with? And like, is was it something that kind of made you interested in being part of this project? Because it is so much about that world. Yeah, well, uh, for me, uh, I grew up playing video games all the time. I love playing video games. I would play, uh, my first ever um, console was the PlayStation 1. And so actually in one of the episodes uh, for Glitch Checks, um, there's one bit where High Five does stealth mode, and that's from uh, one of my one of my favorite games when I was growing up, um, Metal Gear Solid. And so I love that game so much, and it was just really cool that um, in a lot of these episodes for Glitch Hex, we get to see like kind of like you know very similar to real life games and stuff that I've played in the past, and see it like you know into the Glitch Hex you know universe, and it's just so fun getting to do that. And um, I really just yeah, it's such a blast, really. I'm I grew up take... with oh, the sorry, original oh, Nintendo, and I was such a Nintendo fan uh, with Mario Brothers, and then on Super Nintendo, like Donkey Kong Country, and I loved the Legend of Zelda games. Mm. And what made me the, the most excited before I knew anything about the show was Dan Milano, because 10 years ago when I was a little boy, my favorite <laughs> job I ever did was an MTV show with Dan, and I fell in love with his mind. And I knew I want to be involved with anything he does. So for us to work together again all these years later is amazing. And then meet Eric and the amazing cast. And it's just like, I, now I love Eric's mind, Eric and Dan's mind together. And I, I just can't wait to see what keeps coming out of their minds and their hearts. <laughs> 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 um, which brings us to, what do we know about a season? Sorry, did I cut somebody off? Uh, did Zara, did you mention your ga the oh, games you played? Yeah, I, was I know just you're a gamer. Say, yeah, a little bit. I well, okay. I'm gonna date myself a little bit here. I have much older siblings, and they loved the King's Quest <laughs> Sierra Adventure Gaming series. So I growing love that. up, I would play on the IBM, and I loved that like kind of text-based RPG style. And then now I do a ton of voices for video games like Borderlands, Apex Legends, and so it's so cool to be a part of the gaming industry but also to be on this show that is a love letter to the gaming industry. It's so cool. People did bring their games to the show because we would just be talking as the months were going by. You know, like I had been stuck in Castlevania. Um, uh, Monica came in one day, like obsessed with Nico Atsume, which is a, a you know, a cat collection game. And, and Ricardo <laughs> would talk about, you know, getting through Metal Gear. And, you know, the one challenge of the show really is that when you can do almost literally anything as your subject matter, it's very overwhelming. So what you do end up choosing is based on kind of, you know, what's in the collective consciousness of the group, as well as what fits the, the character story. It always has to, you know, somehow connect to the characters. Um, anyway, sorry, Lorraine. No, it's good. That's all, it, you know, and it gives you kind of this, leading to my next question, it gives you this kind of infinite resources and content that you can move forward with, which, do we, what do we know about a season three, or do we, or? We don't yet know. Um, people will be surprised that, you know, as the creators, we, we probably wouldn't be the first to know. And if they would hesitate to tell us, it's because we do things like this. <laughs> We're talking to the fans all the time, and they have to keep us on a leash sometimes. But also, whether it literally happens or not is up to Netflix and Nickelodeon which is why it's so great when people tweet at them directly or, or send letters, uh, if people still do that. It's certainly saved shows in the past and let people know it's appreciated. I've also learned that when it comes to something like Netflix, uh, you know, they kind of see their shows, I think, very much as like a food that they put out on a plate. And if you leave something on the plate, then, you know, you probably are full, you've had enough. Uh, however, if you keep licking that plate, <laughs> like you're hungry for more, they take notice of that and say, gosh, the, if people have watched 
every to the end of every episode and they've watched it multiple times and they're just not stopping so we got to give them more because we we don't have any more as opposed to you know i saw it once and i liked it and they and then you're ready for other titles lick um, that plate lick that so lick the plate <laughs> <laughs> hashtag lick that plate and yeah we, and we definitely have uh an additional 10 episodes that are more than halfway produced um they're already written and uh, already recorded. Yeah, recorded and, and animatic boards are done. So they're literally sitting at Nickelodeon in their servers, uh, just waiting to get animated. So with enough support from the fans and you know the demand for you know release the glitch, I guess, or, uh, renew glitch text hashtag. Um, you know we can maybe make that happen and 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 continue our story. I mean, we definitely have more of the story to tell. We have the lore that continues. We have many unanswered questions, you know, that were left in season two. So we have answers for those, and we have a place to go with the series. We're just we have. Uh, sorry, Eric. Go ahead. No, we're just waiting. We're waiting. <laughs> we're waiting to release it all. I just was going to confirm that you know we did have an episode that deals with um, the Bolipius glitch, which a lot of people are curious about. We have an amazing episode where Five and Miko team up with um, Zara and Hanish and uh, who go on an incredible, incredible mission together where we learn a lot about their characters. Uh, we also yeah, have uh, Hanish. <laughs> Isn't there uh, something about Ninja Turtles or something like this? We did of? work with uh, Kevin Eastman to um, you know, ha let five, you know, meet his heroes from one of his favorite franchises and all franchises have video games. Uh, the licensed games can be glitchy though. A lot of gamers know this. They're rushed into production very quickly. So, you know, when you buy a Ninja Turtles video game, there's a good chance they'll be, they'll be a little buggy. The world uh, needs to see this. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Was also, wasn't there also an episode where like the techs kind of meet like uh, Masters of the Universe type characters? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, there is actually. Um, one of Hanisha's favorite uh, uh, characters. And, and, and one big tease I'm going to put out there, we have another episode where we do, we do return to Castlestein, so. That's right. We do oh, that's an amazing episode. That's an amazing oh, episode. Oh, that was so good. Yeah, I remember that one. That one's so good. <laughs> it's oh, true. Come on. All of it. It's all true. The, the Zara Hanish episode, that was amazing as well. It was a fun, fun, fun road trip episode. Loved it. Yeah, I think there's a rap about calculus in there, or a calculus joke, something to do with calculus. Yes. <laughs> the world needs to see. Yes, <laughs> they do. The world needs more calculus jokes, really, I think. Yes. Uh, I love that our audience will, will notice that there are, you know, it really, the, the show really does celebrate intelligence and, and, and obsession and, you know, healthy obsession. But we also allow the characters to be just full on kind of out of their mind, obsessed with the things they love, because we think that's great. We don't think it's something to make fun of. We think it's a part of our culture. Um, but we do also try to show how they temper those passions and how their relationships mean so much to them. And, you know, the more the characters have ways to identify themselves, the more well-rounded they tend to be. Um, but, we, you know, a love of math comes up quite a bit. Um, and we try to make it somewhat specific. So it's not just a general thing like, yay, math is fun. Um, but it, they use it in their work and, and they use it to solve problems. It means something to them. Geometry books are adorable. They have <laughs> acute angles. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Classic Bergy. Oh my gosh. Classic Bergy. It's a Classic Bergy. <laughs> they all improv so much too. There's so many lines in the show that are things they just will say in the moment or, or based on mistakes and things like that. And it's, so it's wonderful. We're yeah. just so grateful. We have to wrap up in a minute, but I just want to ask you on that note is that like together as a cast, I do a lot of these things where I talk to a lot of people and it's from very different types of shows. There's like this simpatico between all of you that's really, that I can see, it just feels very rare and it feels very genuine. Unless you're just super good actors and you really, really hate each other, but... We love these guys. We, we really do. I mean, uh, you know, I know uh, Scott Kramer and I, we go back, you know, uh, for many years in animation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would hear, hear his voice. He, he, we had an office next to each other when I was developing Glitch Text. 
And when I needed somebody to scratch uh, the character, which means I just need a temp for Phil, of course, I was like, this guy, you know, my friend Scott would be perfect for this. And Monica at the time was also at Nickelodeon running around the studio and I would hear her talking to everybody outside. And I was like, oh, I'm Monica. So bad about that. <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, you saved us because, you know, once I asked her to please scratch this crazy girl character for me and she did, but she brought herself to the character and then we worked the character around this personality that she helped us, you know, bring. And everybody has this unique story that they brought. You know, I know Ricardo, when he came in, it was uh, one of these things where he read the line and, I, and he read it like anybody else did. And then he was about to leave and I read his last name. And I asked him, I was like, hey, are you Latino? And then he's like, yeah. I was like, wait a second, go back in there. I want you to reread a couple of lines in Spanish for me and let's try this out again. And he did, and he brought this new presence to the character. And I was like, that's the character. That's who he is, you know? So just, you know, uh, again, everybody has this unique story that, that they bring to it. Uh, and, and the characters just keep evolving for that reason. And we're just so grateful that we have this amazing cast of people and friends uh, and family now, you know? So it's just been so, so perfect. Yeah, and this has been, um, this panel has been really fun. I have to say, you know, I, I, I'm going to say this because I'm not with the other panels that I've done. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> yes, we win! Oh. <laughs> um, Take that, other panels! <laughs> yeah, other panels, yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for everybody doing this. This is great. Um, for people watching, um, Oh, I also wanted to thank Sue and the MPAC Hollywood Bureau for hosting. Um, this recording will be on the MPAC YouTube, YouTube channel, which is MPAC underscore national, and it'll be there later in the week. Um, but thank you all so much. This has been great, and I'm going to um, look forward to a season three. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do, this. Let's do it. Let's lick that plate. I think that's going to be Yeah, sorry. I think Still that's hungry. hashtag. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Renew glitch text, lick the plate. <laughs> Still hungry, Netflix. Still hungry. <laughs> thank you all so much. And thank, thank you. you all for tuning thanks in. Thanks everyone watching. who joined us. Right. Yeah, thank you, yeah, you. Thank you guys sure. so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you all. If we didn't answer your question, we'll post follow-ups um on uh MPEX thread so everyone will get their questions answered. Thank all right. You. Bye. Thank Bye -bye, you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Love you guys. Thank you.